Then it's a lack of resources, humans and, and funds, inadequate support from decision makers, and low priority. Those are three ideas. Fatima, can you just take them out? Thanks. <laughs> it will always be with you, you never, uh, you've, what's that? You need mechanisms to deal with it fit for use. So the issue here is to always have data quality issues is inherent. Poor data quality is an undeniable fact for systems. Again, lack of clarity on the purpose of the data set. Is there something similar to that? Depends on the purpose. Oh, depends on the purpose. There we go. Inefficient effort devoted to improving fitness for use. Inefficient effort, is it the wrong capacity? Insufficient. Sorry, insufficient. Wrong capacity. Historical constraints of legacy, data in collections. Mm, yeah. And an inadequate, inadequate capacity to deal with capture required in data relevant format. Then, thank you. Then we've got lack of prioritization by creators and those dictating movement of the facility, of the, sorry, the faculty, or for the facility. There we go on that one. And then we got lack of uh, broad general use perspective of data holders or over rapid change of personnel. Would you like to expand on this one? So when you have people coming in and out of, a, of an organization every couple of years, you have a bunch of graduate students that are collecting oh, so, data and so it's, a, you know, it's a bit still of collect for three months and then come back and you work on 15 other projects. It's a process, it process capacity. All right, lack of human capacity, lack of resources, and inadequate support for, from decision makers. Just, I think we'll link, link to that. So. From your institutions, there's quite a number of reasons why you have poor quality data. The, the capacity issues, the funding issues, um, understanding and accepting that data quality will always be an inherent issue. And we saw yesterday when Tom presented, there's this process, you know, like information leaks. One can also say that data quality potentially decreases throughout the, its life cycle. Different methods of capture. There's uh, issues around data process and the way we, this is all part of the data process management, there's historical constraints and inadequate support um, to deal with that kind of institutional support. Does that capture, is there anything that's missing from that? Because it's important that we need to make sure we understand what are the yeah. impediments to data quality. So it can be done also before. Oh, the clean data may also be a poor quality data, depending on the objective of the user of data. If you have data with many gaps in some kinds of data, it may be also poor, uh, poor, uh, yes, a poor quality data. So having clear documentation or the lack of clear documentation in understanding the opportunities or constraints of using the data, would also have, is also part of the reason. All right, as I said, I'll be asking you lots of questions and I would learn to find lots of responses. Now that we've got these reasons as to why we've got poor quality data, I'd like to ask you the following question. Um, what's the impact of poor quality data on your institution currently? If it's such an important thing and you know you've got poor quality data, what does it mean? for your institution. Can you write some ideas down on the card again? Just sit down and think, what's the implication? It's opportunity for research. <laughs> <laughs> opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> write down some ideas and, 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 and let's discuss them. <laughs> The minute you recognize that you have poor quality data or that data that is not of appropriate quality perhaps to benefit people outside of your institution that you would be sharing with, you should take the time to remediate and improve that data. If you don't and you're continually out doing, you know, improving your collections or bringing in more, more data, more information, you just have a greater accumulation of this lower quality data 
and you enhance the problem because instead of having, say, 500,000 records to improve data quality on, each year you're adding to it, you're adding to it, you're adding to it, and you're prolonging the time between when those collections and when that data was collected, and people who may have collected the data may have died, may have moved on, may not remember where things were collected at, and you lose the ability to actually improve the quality of that data. I agree with you, but it'd be great if we could summarize it there. Snowball effect? <laughs> yes. Right, um, I'll start collecting them once you've done. Thank you. So, you'd like to know what's the impact. So you've got an organization, you're going back home, you're sitting there, you acknowledge biodiversity data, quality is important, but you've got poor quality, so what does it mean, potentially? It gets served for the public arena and for use, so what does this mean? I mean, putting it out in the public, potentially institutional embarrassment, reputational damage. Lack of financial support from policy makers. No influence on the, on the decision making. No power. The snowball effect. Kate just described, discussed, uh, explained the snowball effect. It's about, you know, exaggerating the problem. Because you don't fix it up immediately, it just becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. And, and to a point where it feels like it just can't be fixed. Less relevant for powerful science. Uh, solutions, policymakers, more investment to improve quality and use. The impact of poor quality data means this is a quite a positive spin. More investment. The data will stay unusable for analysis. Loss of biodiversity, informed decision, uninformed decisions around decision making and policy and power. Missing data or bad data means you cannot provide info to stakeholders with credibility. Inability to produce quality, accurate results. Loss of relevance to administration and funders. And data not useful for research and decision making. Oh. Anything that you are missing. Sorry, we've got poor quality. All the groups of animals not studied. Several data I think it's old or not updated. And we have loss of credibility. So, anything missing, Tom? I think one thing to pay attention to is that our tools often, too often, explicitly do not take into account poor quality. For example, niche modeling is a very popular tool. And yet, as everybody uses niche modeling, there's no accounting for the fact that one occurrence point may be precise and another may be very broad. There are good techniques for including imprecision, and nobody uses them. So part of this is the impact of poor quality data on the institution. Part of that may be just the scientists need to evolve and use more mature methods. You right 
that actually ties into the okay. context. So Kate has given me a perpetuation of bad habits in data collection. All right. Chris? In a way, you could summarize everything that's on there by saying uh, that the institution is not fulfilling its core mission. It's not taking care of its, what I have called its blue chip mm. part of its mission. And therefore, we fail. Exactly. So th that is the point that we are driving to saying that we want to build institutions. We want to build credible institutions that attracts funding, that attracts support. But yet, the most fundamental, valuable asset, other than the people, is the data. The data set is so critical in driving policy, in driving decision making, in getting the credibility and the reputation of the institution to a point where it has been taken seriously. We see, I had the example of Kanabu yesterday about the fires and how did their information supported critical decision making at a very critical time. So it's quite alarming. I mean, I think everybody's guilty of this. That for knowledge based institutions, our currency is kind of always, sometimes, most of the times, in question. Don? Probably a very critical uh, example is GPS, mm -hmm. where you have two or three major published papers mm -hmm. that basically have analyzed what we can call fitness for use, data quality, in different sectors of GBIF data. And the conclusion has been not fit for use. And that in the scientific community has been quite impactful on GBIF. Simply that the attention has not been put to this issue. And now you see in the published scientific literature that's coming back to bite GBIF on the butt and cause it problems. Thanks, Stan. So what you're saying is also that there's a systemic impact or implication of this issue. So it's going back to GBIF's credibility, you know, it's standing within the community, potential funding from partners. All of that could be undermined simply because we are not paying enough attention to the issue of data quality. Fatima. <laughs> Now. And, and this issue also came up in the, in the GIV of midterm meetings. The issue of the papers that were released that indicated the quality was not um, good. The issue there really also is what is the role of GIVF? Is it a publishing mechanism or is it needing to serve perfectly fit data, perfectly accurate data? And that issue also goes back to then how do you the implementation component of that. As a node manager, I can tell you, if I went to the institutions, that whole process of getting the data on board is a significant process. If we're going to wait for perfect data from them, we're never going to get it. So it's, it's, it's yeah, it's a, a bit of a double-edged sword. Do we wait for perfect data, or do we mobilize what we can mobilize and then put mechanisms in place to ensure that that data gets cleaned and where along that value chain will it be cleaned so done i think the i think the double-edged sword is not double-edged you're doing exactly what you should do you're moving data from the museums and the data repositories and the institutions through to the global community you make the data public as soon as possible. You do not wait for it to be perfect or clean or nice or beautiful. But GBIF, and I don't mean the single G GBIF out, there are lots of institutions like this, but let's take the GBIF example. GBIF could play a massive, significant, and effective role in coordinating and facilitating the data cleaning and the fitness for use. For example, GBIF has 400 million data records. Some of those are from Benin. Perhaps the Beninese could take on the challenge of georeferencing, 
quality control in the geographic references that refer to Benin, even if the specimen is sitting in California. The Californians don't necessarily have expertise in Beninese geography. The Beninese do. So there's a, that's one example to what we did in the Ornus project. There's a significant, effective, cost-effective and cost-efficient niche for a global organization to, at the very least, facilitate that quality control process. Same goes with taxonomic authorities. Same goes with temporal data. Over and over again, what we'll see is that the best place to do the quality control is not always the, the institution that has the cabinet that has the dead bird sitting in it. Sometimes the person in the home country, sometimes the expert in the taxonomy is the person to do that. So I have a, a family of birds that I could claim to have a bit of expertise with, and I have identified those birds at 30 or 40 institutions, checking, catching errors, fixing it up. I don't work there, and they don't want to wait for me to get there. So, no, I don't, I don't say that Jiva should wait until the data are perfect, but rather they should provide paths towards perfecting the data. But that's the point in and of itself. It's the responsibility of the greater scientific community at large to ensure that the data quality is there. You have experts in, in geography, experts in ornithology, experts in the programming in each, each of these different areas. And it doesn't have to be a conveyor belt system, but it's all part of the checks and balances. There are reasons we specialize in different areas, and we have to work together to make sure that's there so that we can all utilize this data 